The Small Business Show, episode 155 for Wednesday, January 24th, 2018. And welcome back to the Small Business Show here at businessshow.co, the show by, for, and about small business owners here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And in Lafayette, California, I'm Shannon Jean. How are you, man? I'm doing all right, man. How are you? You sound like you might be, you might have a little something going on. I'm uh, battling a little something, something that's been going around out here, but uh, you know, we shall endeavor to persevere as we always say. That's right. The good news is it's not just you and me today, so we don't have to do all the talking. Yeah, that's awesome. Couldn't schedule it better. <laughs> hey, so we're joined today by uh, Richard uh, Chapo. Richard's an attorney uh, specializing in online businesses. He's been providing legal services and guidance for uh, 24 plus years to small, large businesses, keeping everybody up to date and compliant with laws and regulations. And we talk about that a lot on here. So uh, welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me on. That's awesome. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Uh, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's awesome. That's good. Well, we're, we're really ha- happy to have you. You know, we recently just did a show uh, about what to do after you get sued. So we're happy to talk about legal stuff and compliance and all that kind of things with you today. Uh, so can you share some of your background with our listeners, how you got started uh, and when you began to focus, uh, you know, on online businesses? <laughs> Uh, sure. I was, uh, you know, I came out of college in 1989. I was looking for some job that would uh, allow me to travel internationally. So my theory was I was going to get into international law and I went to law school. Um, and, you know, the irony, of course, being that I came out and then didn't do international law. I uh, did litigation defense work um, with a boutique firm here in San Diego, where I'm located for about 10 years, um, doing wrongful death and things of that sort that weren't particularly great, but paid the bills. Uh, took a year off when I was sabbatical and Russia came back and had a friend who had become CEO of an internet company. This is in 2000. And if you remember way back then, most people were still on dial-up modems and uh, what have you. And so the uh, the legal area, or the legal field around the internet was very, very um, new. And so it was an interesting area. And so I ended up doing their legal work. And next thing I knew, I was doing internet law and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, that's, that's great. I liked the, the, the one-year sabbatical. That sounds awesome. Yeah. That goes always good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me, we'll start off, you know, is there one, you know, single common mistake that, that, uh, and, and when I say online businesses, I mean, it's pretty, not just folks that are online, but have some sort of online presence, I would imagine. Um, is there some, you know, common mistake that they all make, or is it a combination of things that usually trip up uh, folks? You know, I think the biggest mistake um, at the outset is most people don't sit down with somebody. Um, you know, you really you want to do two things. You want to sit down, one, with an accountant um, just to make sure that you have an idea of how you're going to handle taxes because often how you set up a business or how you organize your business, you know, can have a huge impact on that. Uh, and then second, um, well, for example, just consider the recent tax changes. You know, there's a 20% deduction they're going to pass through uh, for pass-through entities. So if you're an LLC or a partnership, you know, you could take advantage of that, but if you just formed a C corporation for some reason, you know, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of that. Um, the second area would be uh, sitting down with an internet lawyer. I know that sounds like a pitch, but actually what you really want to do is just sit down with somebody. They'll usually give you an hour for free or at least an initial half hour free consultation and just sit down and show them what you're doing. Uh, the point isn't so much to uh, run up legal fees, doing all kinds of little esoteric things. The bigger point is to make sure that they look at it and say, oh, you know, <laughs> this thing that you're doing here, you know, it violates a major law and you could have problems. Um, you know, you built this program that goes out and, uh, you know, scrapes, you know, content from other sites. Maybe, you you know, you're going to have legal issues here. Or, you know, where'd you get all these images? Uh, do you have the rights to use them? Uh, you know, there's just a whole variety of rights. So, uh, most businesses start, you know, they launch and a lot of times they don't know what the legal issues are that they're going to face. And so, you know, if the business takes off, it doesn't really matter. So you look at like Uber, 
you know, Uber's always had a huge issue with our drivers, independent contractors, or the employees. Right. Uh, and you see that they're spending, you know, god awful amounts of money litigating that issue in practically every state and now in other countries. Uh, and it's just a huge issue. And maybe it eventually takes down their business model. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but, you know, uh, hopefully they had somebody sit down with them at the beginning and maybe plan for that issue. It doesn't sound like they did. Um, and so, <laughs> no, they, so they probably say. just did what everybody does, which is just, you know, blaze a trail and uh, ask for forgiveness or, you know, pay a, a fine, uh, which, which I suppose is the same as asking for forgiveness. It just costs a little more. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean the old joke about uh, you know you can pray to God and ask for a bike, or you can steal a bike and then ask for forgiveness, and you know right. which one, which one are you going to go with? But and I think people should charge ahead. To be honest, uh, even as a lawyer, I'll say that I think you should charge ahead. One of the biggest problems with opening an online business, particularly if it's a new business that you're just focused online, so you can get so overwhelmed with information. Six months later, you haven't done anything, um, you know, and, and you see this kind of you know coma status um, because people get so you know think they have to do all these different things. So charging ahead is is great, in my opinion. Um, but just take the time, do a search on Google for Internet Lawyer, run the results through Yelp, um, and go find somebody in your area and just sit down with them and show them, you know, hey, here's what I'm doing. Is there anything I'm going to go to jail for? Right. You know, or right. Anything yeah. like is, that. is there, to kind of ask Shannon's question perhaps a, another way, it, when you do sit down with those people, when they come in for that first consult, it, is there a sort of almost guaranteed most common kind of thing that that people just don't think about um you know yes well the, the most common problem that you see with anybody that comes in is um you know they know that they need terms and conditions and privacy policies they don't they don't really know what those documents do or what they are um and they either you know, get a free copy somewhere online or yep. they quote, quote unquote borrow um, from some site or to get a generator. And it's very much, you know, an area where you get what you pay for. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm in San Diego. I had a guy call me the other day. He's in Georgia. He's in a panic because he's being sued in New York. And I'm looking at it, telling him I can't really help you. I'm not licensed in Georgia or New York. But I was looking at his terms, and his terms, you know, they have what's called a choice of forum clause. And it says if there's any dispute between the users of the website and the website has to be heard in New York. And it's oh. like, well, why'd you put that there? And then it you know, became pretty clear that, that you know, he didn't put that there, that those terms were just, <laughs> he just know, copied it. somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So you run into the, yeah, so you can have those situations. The other thing you see, really, really common problem, probably the biggest introductory problem that you see with websites is um, privacy policies. People include a phrase that says, you know, we will not sell, share, or rent your personal information. Which sounds like a really great idea uh, until, you know, a couple of years down the line, somebody offers you a lot of money for your website. How are you going to sell it? You just promised all your users uh, that you're not going to sell their information. Huh. <clears throat> and we see, yeah, we see these transactions crash all the time. Uh, there's the famous examples. True.com is a dating site and their parent company went bankrupt and they got sucked into the bankruptcy. And Plenty of Fish, another dating site, tried to buy uh, their database and you know, the court shut them down and it, it ended up, you know, terminating a $700,000 transaction because wow. of that. I never That's thought about it that way. Yeah, right. Because the, in, the, in, and this is, you know, sort of the beauty uh, and, and the curse of the law is, is that the law essentially, I mean, there's, there's ways around it as, as you know, but the law essentially goes by what you said, not what you meant. And, uh, and I'm right. sure when those people put those privacy policies in, policies in place, what they meant was, while you are our customer and we are, you know, your service provider, you, we're not going to, you know, sell people your name to use as a mailing list. But it didn't. In, they didn't intend it to mean we didn't. We don't. We won't ever sell our business. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Huh. No, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And that it's, you know, what you're seeing with the laws right now, I'm, you know, referred <clears throat> to this age online as the empire strikes back. Um, you know, it, in the aughts, the last, you know, the first 10 years of this century, we didn't really have a lot of internet rules and a lot of internet laws. And, and what you're seeing is countries and states and what have you are now passing all these laws that are catching up uh, to this point. You're seeing court decisions and things of the sort that are really, you know, a surprise for a lot of people yeah. <laughs> and not in a good way. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I um that is. I mean I now I even hate to tell you that I run a website called macobserver.com <laughs> uh, because not, I mean we've been doing it 20 years things are going just fine but 
I have no doubt. And I'm a pretty good hack lawyer, uh, as, as hack lawyers go. But, you know, I'm a hack lawyer. And, and certainly we've consulted with attorneys over the years and, and all of that. But, but a lot of these things we probably have not run by our attorney over the years because just sort of, you know, happened all very quickly and, and, and was boot bootstrapped. So, huh? Yeah. yeah that's huh. crazy. That's good to know. <laughs> I think, I think, that, I think that that's exactly, I mean, you're exactly hitting on what everybody does. I mean, you're right in that regard. And I don't really have a problem with that. I think what, what people need to do is, I mean, you usually you sit down with your CPA once a year, you should be, you know, trying to proactively plan totally. for taxes because yeah. it'll save you money. You know, I mean, if, if for no other reason than that, it'll save you money. And you should do it with your lawyer too. Once a year, just sit down with them and say, you know, here's how our business has changed. Um, you know, the web changes quickly. And, yeah. Uh, you, know, you need to be focusing on the future, not now. And and that's all fine. But you just just make sure, you know, you run it by somebody. And in a lot of situations, I'll be perfectly honest with you. The answer is going to be maybe. Oh, wait, oh, yeah, oh yeah. Those yeah. are the answers I always sure. get from my attorney. It, but maybe <laughs> and and don't take any offense to this, please, or do. Uh, maybe, and here's a bill for my time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, basically what happens in those situations to, to defend my honorable profession and disregard the photos on the buses, um, <laughs> you know, what's going on there is, is it's risk assessment. And to be honest with you, that's just a lot of business, even totally. the loan legal aspect of it. Totally. Um, and so you could say, so for instance, now we have, you know, this giant European privacy law coming out called the General Data Protection Regulation. It's an ugly, ugly nightmare. And the question for a lot of the U.S. companies is, you know, do they have to uh, comply with the law uh, or the regulation yeah. uh, in the EU? Which sounds like it would be a strange question, except the regulation in the EU says, uh, the new one says that if any business, regardless of where they are, is offering services or products to people in the EU, even if they're free services uh, or products, then you have to comply. Wow. Uh, and so there's going to be two decades or more of litigation over what exactly does that mean? Yeah, how can you force someone in another country to comply? Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh. I mean, that's a valid it's a valid question. I, I mean, there might be a valid answer to it. But if you remember, you know, 250 plus years ago, we had a small little war in this I country. Um, yes. Over the whole you know, taxation without representation. So, <laughs> you know, this is regulation without representation. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, but the question is legitimate. How do you how do you address those issues? And even if they were to find the fines are up to 20, roughly $24 million or 4% of your gross worldwide uh, revenue. And so how do they actually enforce those? How do you collect on uh, that? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. You know, because yeah. I can imagine an EU regulator coming into the U.S. and, huh. you know, you can walk in there with, you know, flag high and what have you. And I imagine most judges are going to be very leery about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not, not going to award you money based on not our laws. Yeah. Wow. Right. So yeah, there's. Yeah. So it's, it's all, but it, you know, as a business, what do you do? Yeah. No, um, yeah. That, it, that can turn into a major headache. Even, even if you can sit here, we, or we can sit here, you know, in the abstract and say, well, I mean, you know, not our laws. Don't worry about it. Well, it, maybe if you got to the end of it, a judge or wh whatever authority it might be, depending on where you're, you know, this case is being heard might say, yeah, it, don't worry about it. But to get from, you know, point A to don't worry about it might cost you, you know, years of time and and many thousands of dollars. And that that can be detrimental enough for your business. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's the uh, it's the hidden trap with, uh, you know, the fair use defense and copyright. Yeah. You know, everybody yeah. likes likes to scream and yell fair use, fair use. And I say, OK, well, you realize that's a defensive trial, right? right. So, <laughs> so we're going to need 100 grand yeah, and exactly. it's going to be a year of your life. Yeah. And even if we win, you're not going to get your 100 grand back in most cases. And uh, so right. let's go get them. All right. Hey, I want to take a quick minute and talk about our first sponsor today. And I'll take the lead on this one, Shannon, since you're uh, under the weather, we'll save your voice and uh, and I'll do this. But our first sponsor today is Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, which is, yes, the correct URL. And you can go there to learn about one of our favorite tools here at the Small Business Show, which is PDF Pen. It is, it truly is the ultimate tool for editing PDFs and going entirely paperless. Uh, you can use it to organize documents. You know, now that it's the new year, new workflow, right? You don't have to stick with those piles of paper anymore. And PDF pen makes it easy 
let alone possible for you to do all this on your computer. You can split and combine PDF documents to send just the right things to your accountant or your lawyer, Richard. Uh, you can fill in PDF forms, whether interactive or not. Like sometimes you get those PDFs that have interactive forms. That's great. Sometimes you don't. And PDF pen lets you fill those in anyway. You can just put text right on any PDF. It's really cool. You can add page numbers. You can redact things like account numbers. Like maybe your attorney doesn't need to know your bank account number uh, in order, or your accountant doesn't need to know your bank account number to do stuff. You can redact that out that way in case that PDF winds up in case you this fat finger, the email and send it to the wrong person. You know what? You're good to go because you've saved at least that information. It can also perform OCR on your scan documents. So, you know, if you're going paperless, you're scanning things in. Well, sometimes you want that data in there to be searchable. You don't just want it to be a picture that's been scanned in. And so optical character recognition, OCR, is there inside PDF Pen to do all this for you. And then you can step up to PDF Pen Pro to create your own PDF portfolios, collection of multiple PDFs and related files it's really great for presenting all your year-end documents. So it, it's one that I, it's a piece of software that I use and have used for over a decade. I know Shannon, you use it too. It, it's really something that is stellar and I couldn't live without it. Uh, you got to check it out. So go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast. That's where you're going to learn all about it. And yes, that's the correct URL. Uh, I know some of you have asked, nope, that's the right one. I'm not screwing it up smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Please go ahead and visit that. See if PDF pen is going to be right for you. I think it probably will be our thanks to smile for sponsoring this episode. Yeah. So, so on that copyright uh, topic, you know, on your website, you mentioned, you know, the DMCA uh, a number of times. Can you, can you talk about, give us for, for folks that are listening that may not know what the DMCA is, you know, tell us what it is and then how, how can it help or hurt your business? So the DMCA is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's a federal law. It was enacted in 1998. And um, it was enacted partially because of some treaty issues. But basically what it tried to do is, um, there are different parts of it. The part that's relevant to most online websites is Section 512. And it, it tries to address the issue of, uh, are websites liable for copyright infringement based on content uploaded by their users? So the classic example, think of Facebook. Um, you know, Facebook is a beautiful business model because if you really think about it facebook doesn't actually create anything they nope. just create platforms yeah. for you to post content well they do they actually uh, create data that, that they homogenize and sell off but you know that's, <laughs> that's different. true yeah 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 sure sure but for end users they yes don't. no they you don't know, they, you're they right create a pretty simple yeah yeah it's a pretty simple but it's a brilliant business model you know i mean that yeah, it's much, totally you know, ucg right guy. totally user user uh, or ugc user generated content right that's it. And so then the question is, is Facebook liable for uh, any infringement by users? And under the DMCA, um, what the federal government decided was the answer is no. So long as Facebook is not the party posting it um, and they're not, you know, obviously making money off of it when it's a really obvious infringement. But in most cases, it's no. It's just there's just immunity for that. However, a certain process has to be followed. Uh, it's called the takedown compliance process, and you have to go through these various steps. Um, and for a lot of websites, you know, these days, I mean, you almost always are going to allow your users to post something, even if it's just comments. Um, so you really want to comply with the DMCA, so you'll have that immunity. Uh, and then there's a process, you know, in exchange for that, you have to go through. So if a complaint comes in, you have to review the complaint as long as it's generally in the right format uh, required under the law you know you're going to go ahead and take down the contested content whatever that is um, and then at that point you're going to send an email or a message off to whoever posted it saying hey we received a copyright infringement complaint uh, you know balls in your court um, and at that point that person can either uh, do what's called a counter notice um, or just drop it and 95 percent of cases they just drop it because mm -hmm. they didn't realize they were creating, you know, they were doing copyright infringement. They didn't have any kind of malicious intent. They just posted something because they thought it was interesting. Um, and then at that point, you know, it, it's over. Or if they do file a counter notice, you then serve that back on the copyright owner. And those two parties can go to court and hack it out. But you're not. But you uh, get to stay out of it. Right. Right. So the advantage of that system is that, um, so Google, I think, receives something like 8 million infringement complaints. It's either a month or a year, whichever it is, it's a lot. Um, and so you're keeping all those potential lawsuits out of the court system. 
Uh, I thought you were going to say eight, eight million a day, and I would have been like, "Yeah, that sounds about right." <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's a month. I'm not sure; it might be a year, yeah. but they, they receive a ton. Uh, yeah. You know, and you can think of forums receive a ton. Google, you know, these kinds of groups, uh, they all receive a, a ton of these, um, and you know, that's. A difficult process for them. Um, one of the big changes in law for this year that people need to know about, particularly small businesses, is to get that protection, you have to designate an agent to receive complaints. So if you've ever reformed a corporation or an LLC, you know, you have to designate an agent for service of process because these are, are you know, kind of just entities out there. There's no real person. You have to pick a person to be that. With the DMCA agent, um, what they're going to be listed on your website, and they're also going to be listed with the registered and listed with the U.S. Um, Copyright Office in an online database. And the cost is an outrageous $6. Um, so, you know, once you go ahead and file them, the, the catch with this whole thing, though, is that uh, under the new rules that the Copyright Office recently released, uh, the agent has to list their physical address, or the, the business has to list its physical address, phone number, an email address. Uh, and so the problem is if you work from home, um, you know, you may not want uh, some of your more enthusiastic fans showing up at the front door uh, and what have you. And so some people use independent agent services. If you have a lawyer, your lawyer will often do it for free. Uh, if you don't have a lawyer, um, there's a site called DMCAAgentService.com. It's a tremendous service providing agents. I should know I own it. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let, let's like, so you spun that out, uh, you know, to focus on this particular uh, requirement. And uh, I mean, that's awesome. It's like looking again. And what's the problem these folks are having? And you kind of make it a seamless, easy process that just happens, uh, very inexpensive, and they just kind of re-up every year and they have that agent, is that right? Right. And then, you know, eventually if they go to the point where they have an office or something of that sort, then they don't, they don't need us anymore because obviously, you know... You know they can do it. If you have an office, you're not too worried about people yeah. Yeah. showing up in the middle of the night and that kind of thing. Uh, you That's know, really so it's smart, really man. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's, I, that's I really do. Cool. I want to say one thing just while we're talking about the DMCA is it, it and you, you mentioned this sort of in passing with the DMCA, you as the the website owner or publisher, I should say, are effectively it's it's a guilty until proven innocent uh, scenario, meaning when you get that takedown notice, you have to take it down right away. Or risk having perhaps your provider shut you your entire site down or or more and, you know, kind of going further and further up the chain there. Um, it, and right. like you said, if you didn't post, if, if you if it was one of your users, you can sort of, you know, step out of that mix once you take it down. But it is on you as the publisher to take that down. And, and that that that's it, it's a weird it's a weird sort of corner case of U.S. law in that sense that you don't get to fight first. You fight later. Yeah. And it is an area that causes a lot of confusion. So people get just violently angry when sites take down their content. Oh, yeah. And what, the law, what the law says, and you're absolutely right, is it doesn't say evaluate the complaint and determine whether there's copyright infringement. The website or the app, whatever it is, has to take down the content. Yes. And if they don't take down the content, not only can they have to worry about their own site, but they lose the immunity under the DMCA. Right. Uh, right. So right. Me, yeah, so yeah, you're complicit you at that point. Yeah. Yeah, be a real world example where this can become a problem that people don't think this through. A lot of people go out and they develop social media lists uh, or followers, and you know they're trying to get Instagram followers or whatever it is, as many as they can. Um, well, there's a part of the DMCA. I mean, we could talk about the DMCA all day, but part of the DMCA uh, is uh, called the re repeat infringer section. So the repeat infringer deals with the situation where you have somebody who just keeps posting infringing content. Uh, well, after a certain amount of time, you know, they should have their accounts terminated. And so under the DMCA, they're required to do that. So yeah. what happens is uh, a site sets up its policy. So let's say it's, in, well, let's say it's Tumblr because I know Tumblr does this. Uh, and Tumblr says maybe it's, you know, if you get three complaints in two years, three valid complaints in two years, you know, we, we have to terminate your account. Um, and, uh, you know, you build up 50,000 followers and then you, you every once in a while post something that's copyright infringement and somebody files a takedown notice. Well, at that point, Tumblr has to take down that content. And when they do, if you don't counter notice, that's a successful copyright complaint against you in, in the view right. of Tumblr. And if you get two or three of those, they close your account. And, and you, and you lose access to all those 50,000 followers. Sure. Yeah. Wow. And you're, and you're oh. not getting back. 
Nope. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, got, I, I dealt with a DMCA thing. We had a guy that worked for us. So, so this was content that we published and uh, he wor- he actually worked for the business we acquired that turned into our business. So we didn't have any of these work product contracts with for any of this content that, that we had purchased, although we had a business, you know, purchase and sale agreement for the business. Uh, one of the authors came and sent a DMCA notice to our web host and the web host, of course, passed it through so that they were. Uh, you know, no longer liable. They get their immunity, uh, but we had to take the content down, even though, you know, by all rights, he was paid for it by the previous owners. We paid the previous owners for all the content. We should have been able to keep it up, but nope, we had to take it down because we couldn't, we had to take it down first. Then we had to look to see if we could prove that we were able to put it back up and we couldn't. So instead we replaced because the guy, the guy said he was worried about people finding uh, these articles that he had written 15 years prior when he knew less than he knew now. And uh, instead of being a nice guy about it, he just did it this way. So what I did is I replaced the articles with uh, with text that said, hey, you know, this guy came to us and filed the DMCA notice and basically said this guy's a real jackass uh, for doing this and he didn't do it the right way. But, you know, that's why this content's missing. So anybody searching for his name might actually find that <laughs> instead, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you talk, you talk to your lawyers before doing that. I actually, I did. Right, right. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. They were That's like, great. "Well, is what you're saying true?" And I said, "Yeah." I mean, I didn't call. <laughs> exactly. I, I didn't call the guy a jackass. I just laid out the path so that anyone reading it would naturally come to that conclusion. <laughs> I was going to say defamation. No, there was no defamation. No, no, no. There was just a path. I just, I laid out the facts. That's it. That's it. That's he was pissed. Well, yeah. You know, if we're, yeah, no, I, I, I understand. <laughs> hey, I'm really dealing with it. And it I is want a to Yeah. Hey, I want to jump into one thing too. Uh, and cause I, I know copyright stuff we can talk about forever. Um, but, uh, I want to talk about getting paid. Um, we, we talk a lot about on the show about, you know, effective methods to get paid and we, you know, getting paid right after you do your work or even before, you know, work that you're completing. And, uh, one of the things I, that, that, uh, popped up when I was looking at your info, Richard, up on your, on your site was, some issues with recurring billing and uh, what kind of legal requirements are in place for that. And cause we promote, you know, on the show, we're talking, Hey, if you're going to be doing consulting or whatever it is, you know, recurring building billing is awesome and uh, just happens. So can, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. If you're doing recurring billing online, what we're talking about is, you know, uh, let's take an example, like a, a dating site where you pay a monthly fee. Um, there is no federal law uh, that prohibits that. And there is no state law that prohibits that. But w- there are about 30 plus states now that have laws that require you to make certain disclosures. Oh. Um, you know, if you're going to bill somebody online on a, a reoccurring basis, whether it be monthly, yearly or whatever. Uh, now, the genesis of all this <clears throat> is not the legitimate businesses. The genesis of all this is, as you may remember, particularly in the, the more wild, wild west times of the web, was there were uh, a lot of sites, particularly adult sites, that would offer you know three-day free trial for seven ninety nine uh-huh. or something like that. And, uh, you know, you get billed thirty nine ninety nine a month after that. And you say, well, OK, that sounds like a great deal. And you sign up, you slap a credit card down and, you know, you go onto the site, whatever it is. And you look around and day three comes around and often you've forgotten. Or if you want to cancel, it is slightly impossible to find a link to actually do that. Oh, uh, <laughs> and so you had massive abuse. And what was really happening with some of these companies were... Um, uh, there were fronts for the mob um, or other groups like that who didn't care about chargebacks. What they really wanted was your your name, your payment information, and a credit card number. Got it. Because that's invaluable in the real brick and mortar world. You can do all kinds of things with that, and it has real value. Um, you know, it's kind of a precursor to all, all the you know hacking that you see today, where people are trying to get that information. Um, so that was kind of what was going on there. So anyways, the states and their hackneyed approaches, they now require these disclosures. They're different for each state, um, but the general idea is that uh, when you have that page where people are going to sign up um, and they're going to hit submit before they do that, you have to put up a notice that says something. And again, check with your particular state, but it says something generally along the lines of, you know, this is what you're going to be charged. This is what you're going to be charged after the free trial or, you know, if there's a free trial after the free trial. Um 
um, here's how you contact us. And then, you know, depending on that information, they hit submit, they sign up. Uh, at that point, you should send them an email saying, hey, great, welcome to the site. And in that email, there also has to be pretty much the same disclosure saying, you know, it's somewhere at the bottom in the actual text. Now, you can't bury it down in the footer. But in the actual text, what I tell my clients is use, use it as a positive. Say, hey, we just want to make sure you remember you're being charged, you know, monthly. If you ever want to cancel, you know, here's a link and da 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 yeah, yeah, you can do that in a way yeah. that that actually makes you look good. Yeah, right. builds trust. Builds right. trust. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think absolutely. And I think yeah. the thing, and that's, I mean, you point out a perfect thing with a lot of these rules, particularly the FTC regulations on affiliate disclosures and things of that sort. Don't fight them. Right. Don't fight them. Um, you know, use it exactly as you're talking about to build credibility. Hey, we want to let you know. You know, unlike other sites, you know, we want to let you know we're getting you know something free or whatever it is. Yeah. Exchange for this, and people will, you know, people will appreciate that. Um, and and you know, that's a pretty time tested model on the web, you know, to get, to build a favorable brand. So yeah, definitely try to be positive. With it. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, uh, so I want to talk about your own business for, for a few minutes here. Um, so if you, if listeners of the show know, you know, we're Dave and I are big fans of mistakes, uh, Primarily, well, because we've made so many, but uh, they since they teach us so much, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, so we always ask our guests, you know, what would you say is your best mistake that you've made uh, with your law practice over the years? That something that really struck you and uh, uh, sticks with you to to this day. Um, you know, I think law law is kind of odd because it's it's a pretty static. Uh, profession laws are not, but the actual practice of the law is. And um, so when I started out, it was, you know, this is pre internet, and um, the way that firms build was primarily based on time. They'd bill you at, you know, 0.1 increments an hour, and there were six increments, and they would bill you for mail and for everything, basically. And that was the model that I learned. Um, and when I went online, uh, you know, I, when I first went online, I was in a unique position that this, the company that the friend of mine was the CEO was a resource site, huge one for the adult industry of all things uh, online. And so I was like the only attorney. And so it was, you know, moment to pick up clients because if you're the only choice you know no matter how bad your pitch is you tend to <laughs> pick them up sure uh, and i had all kinds of problems with clients over the billing um you know and and soon realized that you know that model while it may have worked for large corporations and insurance companies you know sure as heck wasn't going to work with clients um and so i went to more of a flat fee basis i try whenever possible um you know huh. with clients unless they're ongoing you know i try to give them a flat fee um, and cause you know, at this point after 20 years, I have a pretty good idea what's going to, you know, the time that's going to take. Uh, and I bet and your be clients brute. appreciate that too. I mean, it, it, you know, coming in with the idea of, I don't want to say a fixed cost, but a predictable cost is, is much better than that. Sort of, like you said, that classic, well, I don't know how much it's going to cost. It depends on how often I talk to my attorney, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I do have clients that are on, on billing, you know, but those tend to be larger clients. Um, but yeah, you know, for the, definitely for the smaller clients or the new clients, yeah, they definitely appreciate it. Cause then, you know, they know what it is. And to be honest, it's helpful for me too, because, um, you know, then they're less likely to be hesitant to talk to me or to pick up the phone. Um, uh, when you're talking to your lawyer, here's a helpful hint. I don't care about the strong points of your business or your life or whatever the issue is. I care about the weaknesses. Um, you know, when you get up on the stand in trial, nobody's going to ask you about, you know, the uh, perfect A's you got in college. They're going to ask you about, you know, getting arrested naked in the van with five other people. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how did you know about know. that? Yeah. I was just right. I don't even know said that. <laughs> but if you haven't told me about that and I'm standing there going, hearing it for the first time in court, you know. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah. I I was looking yeah, happy. I was looking at an email that I sent to one of my uh, attorneys almost 2 years ago about this thing that hopefully is wrapping up soon. But um and and I I it was a follow up after a conversation and I wrote to him I said, "Look, I I just want to tell you all these things." I said because the the even worse than lying to my attorney would be omitting things accidentally, yeah. you know, like, so it can come gonna, back to haunt you. For yeah. Sure. So I'm just going to brain dump this stuff at you, man. And, you know, do with it what you want. But at least now I know I've told you everything that I think is that I did wrong here. What, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. Well, so. and in litigation, you absolutely want to know that. Right. Uh, absolutely. Right. And just to be clear, you know, the information is protected by the attorney client privilege. The of attorney's course. not going to share that with anybody else. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you would definitely want to know the weaknesses now in business, you know, it's, a situation where 
um, uh, you know, for my clients, some of my larger clients, <clears throat> you know, it's mostly trying to figure out if the other party actually knows what they're doing or not. Um, you know, there's some different issues there, but yeah, no, absolutely. If you, if there's some weakness to the business or something, don't hide from it. Because if you tell me or you tell your attorney, you know, then we can try and figure out solutions. Right. If you don't tell us and a letter comes from the FTC one day, you know, like with VTEC just recently received a letter, you know, we want $4 million in fines yeah. for failing to, you know, comply with a, a child, you know, privacy law. Uh, well, at that point, it's too late. Right. And, and you know? I think that... Uh, you know, with a lot of entrepreneurs and, and business people that are kind of plowing forward and, you know, we talk about it here a lot, you know, creating their own reality. And I mean, it's great and it can help you make, make you very successful, but it's often, uh, it can cause you to overlook those weaknesses. And, and if there's one person you need to talk about that stuff with it's it's your attorney right? Uh, for sure. So yeah, you don't want to obsess well, over them. You, in fact, you want to let yeah. your attorney obsess over them folks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Well, Richard, right. uh, I think, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's why I think, you know, meeting with them once a year, even just yeah. for half an hour is good. Just tell them what you're doing, what your you know, plans are. And that, that is going to take care of a lot of the potential problems. That's great. Well, you know, I, I've, I've definitely uh, learned a lot of stuff here today and, and we really appreciate you coming on the show. What's the best way for uh, our listeners to learn more about your firm and the services that you offer? Uh, you can always reach me uh, through my website, SoCal, like uh, Southern California, SoCalInternetLawyer.com. Uh, you can always do a search for me online, Richard Chapo, C-H-A-P-O. Uh, unfortunately, there's a Mexican drug lord who went by the nickname El, <laughs> El Chapo. That's not me. Not related. Uh, so if you see search results mentioning the FBI and things of that sort, that's not me. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, Richard Chaplin should be able to find me. That's great. And we'll, you know, of course, we'll have you linked here in the, on the show notes. And, uh, you know, thanks for hanging out with us and talking about the small business legal issues. It's been great. Yeah, I feel better. Awesome. Yeah, of course. <laughs> keep plowing through. Thanks, folks. Yeah, keep doing what you got to do. Visit us at businessshow.co. Keep living that charmed life. And thanks for joining us, Richard. 